First of all, I was asked to make this announcement. If you'd like to make a donation in uh, memory of Coach Wag or in honor of Johnny, we've got cards on the table. Uh, if you would just get that to Lori or Brandy. Lori, would y'all raise your hand, Lori and Brandy. Or just get that to them. They will take care of that. I'd like to start things off by recognizing our current Hall of Fame members. If you're present, please stand. If, if uh, they are not present, we've got family representing them, it'd be great if you'd stand. I'm going to just start at the beginning of the class of 90 and work my way up. And then at the end of that, we'll, we'll give a big round of applause for these folks. Class of 90, Billy Bach, Lonnie Qualls, Fritz Aaron, Gail Condart, Glenn Rice, Walter Willis. Moving up to the class of 91, Willard Ralston, Dwight Blakely, George Henry, Frank Ingram, Johnny Bach, and Francis Morris. Class of 92, Frank Kuhn, Rex Yerby, and Bob Chance. Class of 93, Annabelle Hess Rice, Robert Aaron, Ralph Brown. <coughs> Class of 94, Bill Crowder, and James Rackley. Class of 95, Roy Ralston, and Billy Seabolt. Class of 96, Robert A. Hurley, Dorothy Caldwell Salter. Class of 97, Ron Marvel and Ted Young. Class of 2000, Charlie Spoonhour. Class of 2002, Penny Peppas Burns. Class of 2003 is Bill Alverson. Class of 2004, Sylvester Benson, Leroy Douglas, O.D. Hightower, Stephen Kennedy, Charlie Rofini. Class of 2005 is Ray Basinger, Marilyn Bauer, and Fletcher Lowry. Class of 2007, Lori Myers and Kenneth Little. The class of 2009, Marcos Gonzalez and Anthony Porche. Let's give a big round of applause. This year we'll be inducting the class of 2011, representing Coach Wag. We're going to have uh, President of the University, uh, Dr. Rick Neese. Before I begin, if you would also recognize members of our advancement staff and our athletic department who put on this great thing every year, would you, would you guys please stand, please? Athletic Department Advancement Staff. Before I begin with Coach Wag, I want to congratulate Coach Johnny Johnson as well. Johnny, I've always had a great deal of admiration for your grace and your style. And you and Robin were among the first people that Shree and I met when we came to Clarksville for the interview. And I have to tell you, you got me off on the right foot. And I'm always indebted to you for that. Congratulations on this great honor today. I'm proud of you and we're proud to have you in our Hall of Fame and back on this campus. Dolores, Jay, Mitch, please know what an honor this introduction is for me. And what a well-deserved honor for Coach Jerry Wagner. Coach loved this campus and our distinguished athletic traditions so very much. And he loved teaching students equally as much. Coach Wagner was as fine an educator as I will ever know. Students loved Coach Wag. 
He knew the importance of teaching physical education to students who would go on to become teachers and coaches themselves. He taught them the respect that physical education deserves and the integrity that coaching requires. I feel a overwhelming sense of irony in being asked to be the one to speak for Coach Wagner today. First of all, anyone who knows Jerry Wagner knows that no one could speak for him. He was too unique for someone else to truly represent him. Now, for a number of years, I never understood why Coach was not a member of the Hall of Fame, why this induction had not already occurred. I finally discovered that it was because he did not want to be nominated. That confused me, so I spoke to Coach directly and asked him if we could nominate him for the Hall of Fame. He very emphatically told me no, and I was taken back by the firmness in his voice. He then explained why he did not want to be nominated and asked me to keep his reason between us, and I have never shared that reason with anyone. Now, I did not know Coach Jerry Wagner for as long nor as well as many of you did. I certainly did not know him during his glory days as an athlete at Ozarks. Hence, I feel at a, at a bit of a disadvantage. But during the past several years, I did get to know and had the great fortune of getting to know Jerry Wagner very well. During our early morning chats in the president's office. Now, I arrive at my office at about 6 a.m. and my initial task of each new morning is to make the coffee. Now, I don't drink coffee myself, but I enjoy making it for others. And the first person to greet me in those early morning hours was Coach Jerry Wagner. Coach liked my coffee. It was strong, black, hot, and best of all, from Coach's viewpoint, it was free. <laughs> free coffee is what initially brought Coach to the President's office, but conversation is what kept him coming back. Now, as many of you know, Coach Wagner was not particularly fond of senior administrators, and maybe presidents in particular. And I think it took a while and an innumerable number of cups of coffee for him to warm up to me. But we did become friends, and I will forever cherish that friendship. During our early morning talks, usually from about 6.30 till about 7, I got to know Coach Jerry Wagner. He loved the St. Louis Cardinals and the Dallas Cowboys, visits to Porky's and pictures of old Milwaukee, country music and Merle Haggard, the outdoors in his cabin, newspapers and books, old western movies and John Wayne, he loved telling stories and further embellishing those stories with each retelling. And he enjoyed friendly debates and politics. Coach, the far left liberal, relished egging on his right wing conservative buddies. On a number of mornings, I watched as he pushed his ultra conservative friends, primarily Robert Walford and art teacher Blaine Caldwell as hard as possible, and they would push right back. But he never lost his temper. Well, there was one morning a couple of years ago that I saw him angry, but it had nothing to do with politics. Coach came into my office, and as he poured his cup of coffee, he was fuming. Do you know what one of my students asked me in class yesterday? The coffee splashed as he relived the student's question. Coach sat down to calm himself and continued. Now, I was telling the class about my football playing days. I was not bragging, but I was describing our style of play and how the game has changed over the years. Then, from the back of the classroom, one of the male students blurted out, Hey, Coach, did you play during the era when players could fold up their leather helmets and shove them into the back pocket? Coach's face reddened even more as he repeated the student's question. 
Can you believe that a student would ask me that? Can you believe it? I paused a perfectly timed pause and responded, well, coach, could you fold up your helmet? <laughs> he then laughed, that full, rich, raucous laugh that was the very essence of Jerry Wagner. I miss that laugh, and I miss coach. <clears throat> the mornings are a little emptier now. Dolores, I cannot imagine how much you miss your husband. Jay, Mitch, I cannot imagine how much you miss your dad. I know that your days are also emptier. Coach filled a big void in so many lives. And there was a void in this hall of fame until today. Coach Jerry Wagner's induction fills that void perfectly. Thank you, Dolores, for allowing us to honor him. I know that he is pleased, and I know that he has already taught Tom Landry and Bear Bryant a thing or two about football. <clears throat> Welcome to the Hall of Fame, Jerry Wagner. We waited, and you earned it.
Some people would say Terry Garner took a chance on a little kid who tagged along. I say the Johnny Johnson we're honoring here today is a man who, given the chance, sparked a love of basketball that still endures. Johnny left Arkansas College, went to be Mike Newell's assistant at UALR, served there as a graduate assistant. <coughs> Some people would say Mike Newell took a chance on a young man who'd never coached at the NCAA <coughs> level. I say the Johnny Johnson we're honoring here today is a man who, given the chance, learned how to motivate young men on any level and helped lead UALR to its first ever appearance in the NCAA tournament. Johnny came to Ozarks in 1990, went right to work furthering his education, earned a master's degree in education at Arkansas Tech. He also went right to work making Clarksville home, joined the local Methodist church right down the road here, same church where he later married his wife Robin, his sons Drake and Bryce were later baptized. Some people would say the University of Ozarks took a chance on hiring a 26-year-old with no head coaching experience. I say the Johnny Johnson we're honoring here today is a man who, given the chance, led this university to its best days and made the gymnasium next door. Johnny and all of us in Clarksville, whose lives he's touched, are grateful to Ozarks and this community for taking a chance and believing in him. There were people who were behind Johnny, believed in him, and supported him along the way. They helped Johnny make Clarksville home. Some of you are here. Johnny enjoyed his noon golf outings at the country club in the summer with Fritz Aaron and the other guys. Jack Patterson kept him involved in local social activities. Johnny joined the Clarksville Taekwondo softball team, met a lot of people there. Lonnie Qualls, Coach Wagner, and Jack Jones helped him find his way around campus. Johnny's always enjoyed interacting with young people. He taught math here in addition to his basketball coaching duties. He liked that because that allowed him to meet students who weren't basketball players. Johnny always speaks of what a privilege and an honor this university has given him by allowing him to coach and recruit the young men he worked with. Let's think for a minute about the quality of some of the players he recruited and or coached here. So stop for a minute and picture maybe your favorite players. <coughs> some people would say Anthony Porche, Patrick Prater, Marcus Hampton, Travis Acord, and Stephen Kennedy took a chance leaving home playing for an inexperienced head coach. I say the Johnny Johnson we're honoring here today is a man who, given the chance, led these guys to basketball success they never imagined. Porsche is still our school's second leading scorer, holds a school record for the most career three-pointers. Patrick Prater, who's here today, is our fifth leading scorer, fourth in career assists. Marcus Hampton is a career assist leader here. Travis Acord holds school records for most career block shots and most block shots in a season. Stephen Kennedy is our scoring and rebounding leader. Sixth in career assists. No better player will ever play here. Kennedy and Porsche preceded Johnny into this Hall of Fame, and more of his players will likely follow. In the 11 short years Johnny was here, he coached three of the school's top five scorers and most of our other better players. And keep in mind that Johnny recruited these players and won these championships in the Arkansas Intercollegiate Conference. And now I'm going to say this about us, so I wouldn't really want anybody else to, but he recruited these kids to this school, the school with the lowest enrollment and the worst facilities in the league. And he got these kids to leave home and come here. Johnny's family's been with him every step of the way during his career at Ozarks. His wife Robin, parents Reuben and Charlotte didn't miss many games, home more on the road. His brother Reuben, sister Katie, sons Drake and Bryce are here with us today. Johnny's always found time to volunteer as well. For over 21 years, He's been a volunteer for the Special Olympics, played on their unified softball and skiing teams. When Johnny left here in 2001, he became the athletics director at the Little Rock School District. Some people would say the Little Rock School District took a chance on a young man with no administrative experience. I say the Johnny Johnson we're honoring here today he is a man who, given the chance, has become one of the best athletic administrators in the state. Johnny oversees all the athletic activities in Little Rock's five high schools and seven middle schools. These activities include athletic transportation, scheduling, coordination of officials, and a plethora of other duties. Johnny's a certified master's athletics administrator, one of only three people in the state to hold this certification. So after telling you all these things about Johnny Johnson, the thing I can't adequately tell you is what a great person he is, but I'll try. In my life, when I've needed help, I've called Johnny Johnson. Whether it was after an insignificant event, like when I ran out of gas on Crawford Street, 
or a very significant event to me, the death of my grandmother. Johnny Johnson was the first person I called. There was never a question of if he would come. He did come on both those occasions I mentioned and on many others. And that's what Johnny Johnson does. He comes when you need him and he helps you. He's never too busy. He never offers excuses. Some people would say Robin took a chance on a young bachelor who left her for a year to move to Clarksville, but later asked her to become his partner in life. But I say the Johnny Johnson we're honoring here today is a man who, given the chance, has been the best husband she can imagine, and that he's never disappointed her. Johnny's wife, Robin, sons, Drake and Bryce, are so fortunate to have his influence in their lives on a daily basis. The last thing I want to tell you about Johnny Johnson is something that everybody that knows him well can probably say. Knowing him has made me a better person. And thank you for that. At this time, I'd like you to welcome Johnny Johnson. Special. 
And uh, Jerry Wagner was such a fun person. And when I first got here, Jerry and Jack Jones and Lonnie Qualls were just super to me. And uh, you know, as most of you know, I, I got to tell you one of my favorite Jerry Wagner stories. He always had his cabin out here outside of town. And I can't remember if it was Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights, but we'd have steak night once a month or once every two months where everybody would bring a steak and uh, Jerry would supply the fixings. And, and so right, shortly after Bryce was born, and so Robin told me if I was going to the cabin, I had to take Drake with me. And Drake wasn't but about three years old. And uh, he's like he is now. He doesn't make a stranger. He talks to everybody. So Phil Pittman was out there, and I was helping, you know, something like Lonnie and Wag, those other guys. I'd have to help them cook, and I couldn't keep an eye on Drake. And so everything went really well, and we got back home. And uh, the next day, I'm sitting there in the office, and the phone rings, and it's Robin. And she says, do you want to know what your son just said? And I said, no, what, what happened? She said, well, I've got had Drake in the floor playing with him all morning. And I asked him, I said, what would y'all do out at the cabin? He said, well, not a whole lot. We just sat around bullshitting. <laughs> she said, you tell Jerry Wagner that's the last time that Greg is going with you to the cabin. But Wag, Wag and I, we had so many of the same interests. You know, we both like football. We both like the St. Louis Cardinal baseball team. We both like Merle Haggard, and we both like the Beast. He finally got away from Old Milwaukee like, and we finally moved him up to the Beast. But uh, he had some of the best sayings that, that I still use. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'd say, hey, Wag, let's, let's go over here and watch the soccer team play. And Wag would say, you know, I'd just soon hold a horse in the rain than to go over there and watch that soccer game. <laughs> But I guess, I guess my favorite one of Wag was, uh, you know, he loved the Cowboys. I hated the Cowboys. So every time the Cowboys would get lead or play bad, Wag would come in to, to the office, and I had to rib him, and I'd say, hey, Wag, how about them Cowboys? He said, I tell you what, they look like shit on a white rag. <laughs> and so I, that became one of my favorite sayings at halftime when we weren't playing bad and those players never knew where I got that. But, uh, and uh, Wag, I, I guess the favorite story that he had was uh, he went to Fort Smith to see Merle Haggard. He loved Merle. And he got in a scuffle down there and got his shirt tore off. <laughs> the only person to tell that story better than him is Denton Thomas. And I wish Denton was here today. But he got his shirt tore off, came up underneath the table, and all he had on was his collar. But they kicked him out, but Merle saw it wasn't his fault, so Merle let him come back in. And at the end, he finally got to get Merle's autograph. And he went up to Merle, and he said, just make it out to Wag from the hag. And he had, that on, had it on his ball cap all the time. But, uh, you know... Wag loved uh, the Cardinals, and he loved the Cowboys, he loved Merle, but uh, Dolores was the apple of his eye. He loved Dolores. And Robert and I always had a good time. We'd go with Wag and Dolores to the Eagles. We'd go with them to the Hilton Brothers parties. And uh, they were super to me and my family. They loved Drake and Bryce. But I know if Wag was here today, he would say, I just soon hold a horse in the rain and have to go to that damn banquet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's really ironic that I ended up at the University of Ozarks because growing up, my mom graduated, and I heard uh, from, from college at Ozarks, and uh, had so many stories. She loved her time here, and, uh, she, you know, she was a homecoming queen, met some of her lifelong friends, and many of them here today, and... Uh, her roommate, college roommate, Maxine Stack. She married Don Stack. Don was up here. Maxine and Don, you stand up. They were they were at my first press conference in Little Rock. They uh, followed us for 11 years, and uh, Don's been an advocate of this university for many many years. And they were just two special people. She talked about Dr. Fritz Aaron. She talked about Gail Condark. What great athletes they were. And it's, a, it's really an honor for me to be going in the Hall of Fame when Gail Condark and Fritz Aaron are also there. But it was always fun for me knowing that so many of her 
classmates and lifelong lifelong friends pulled for us to be successful. Uh, even my dad, he spent a semester here at the University of Ozarks, and uh, he left after the first year. He said it cost too much. He had to transfer to Texas. But they, uh, they all enjoyed their time. So, but. <clears throat> I'll always be indebted to, to Dr. Aaron. Dr. Aaron was the president here when I got hired him, and Gene Stevenson gave me the opportunity to come to Ozarks. And uh, there were not very many places that would have hired a single 26-year-old, but I can still remember how excited I was when I got the call that I was going to be the next head coach at the University of Ozarks. Because if I didn't get it, I would have had to go with Coach Newell to Lamar, and we knew he was going to get fired every time. And so it was really good to get this job. But uh, I guess after me, uh, the next two most people excited as I was was my mom and dad. Uh, number one, I was only 40 minutes away from magazine where they live. Uh, I was at their alma mater, and. More importantly, I'd finally have a decent paying job. So that, that was big. We, uh, we had a press conference in Little Rock, and we had Sonia and them did a really big press conference here on, on campus. And my dad, he was so impressed with how nice everybody treated me at the press conference. And he kept saying, I sure hope they're this happy with you this time next year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I've had so many people to thank. But first, there's no way I could be standing up here today if it wasn't for the players. We had some outstanding players, and we were fortunate that we inherited some when I got here, and we were also fortunate to recruit some really good players. You know, it's so exciting to be going into the Hall of Fame with Stephen Kennedy and Anthony Porche. The you know, Stephen was all-time leading scorer and rebounder. Anthony was all-time or second leading scorer. But uh, I think we've got I've got three players here today. Uh, Jason Wilbanks. Jason, if you stand up, Jason played for Matt. He's from Ozark High School. Kendall Jackson. <laughs> Kendall was here when I got here and helped me coach. And then Patrick Prater and his mom and dad, the Praters, are here. I, I pre but the players were such. We, had, we, we were very, very fortunate uh, to have the type of players that, that we had. And so many of them, you know, graduated, went on, and uh, have had outstanding careers and got their degrees in four years. You know, uh, Patrick got his degree in business. Uh, Kendall's teaching at Little Rock Central now. So many of uh, Ryan Marshall's coaching at BB. Trent, T Trent, Trent Tipton is at coaching at Moulton. And, Porsche's with Walmart, Lee Whitaker. I mean, it, we can go on and on, but we had quality kids, and that that was just super for me. Uh, you know, I still get asked a lot, "Do you miss coaching?" And I tell everybody, I I don't miss the recruiting. Uh, I don't miss going in at halftime or at the end of the game when you didn't play very good and getting mad. I sure enough don't miss the referees, <laughs> and, uh, but I do I do miss the interaction. With, with the players and watching them grow up and, and come in. And, uh, you know, Patrick Prater was a prime example. I mean, when he came up here, he didn't say three words to me uh, at the recruiting, but to watch him grow and turn into what he is today, a successful insurance man, uh, that's what was fun. You know, that, that's what was what it was all about. Uh, I'd also like to thank you. Know, I, was, I was fortunate I had about four or five people that helped me as assistant coaches. Charles Terry, who well, I first three years was with me, and Charles was a former Razorback. Uh, he was an assistant coach at McClellan. I didn't know Charles, but one of my best friends, Jerry Holder, played for him. He said, if you get a chance, you need to hire Charles. And uh, Charles came in, was, was a little older than me, so he, he was a good common influence. But uh, he, had, he was like me, though. He had a great rapport with the players, had a bad rapport with the officials. So we, we hit it off really good. <laughs> Steve, Steve Sisk is not here, but Steve was here when I got here. He'd been assistant coach. He was in, instrumental in helping me in the transition process with the players we had. Kendall was, was one of those players, and, and Steve is uh, assistant coach at Clarksville. He's done a super job. Uh, Kyle Helms. Kyle, sitting. Kyle, you need to stand up. Everybody needs to see Kyle. He's a sonic guru here in town. And, and uh, 
Kyle came to all of our games when we were the first fighters. He knew he loved basketball. So when we went to Division Three and we had a chance we needed an assistant, I asked Kyle to come help. And I have to tell one story on, on Kyle. We were, we were playing down at Howard Payne. And you know, Howard Payne's like Ozark, it's a Christian school. And uh, after the game was over, I had never seen this, but, but in the girls game, after the girls game was over, they all got in a huddle and said a prayer, and I didn't think anything about it. And then the Howard Payne game, we were behind 10 at halftime, and we ended up winning by 10. And so as soon as the game's over, you know, I'm the first one shaking hands, and I'm, boom, I'm going to the locker room. I didn't realize that they were getting together to hold hands and say a prayer with the men's team. So I'm sitting up there for two or three minutes wondering what happened. Pretty soon one of the players come in. I said, what's going on? I said, well, after the prayer, we got in, they got into a fight. <laughs> and Coach Helms had tried to break the fight up. And he ended up on the bottom of the dog pile. <laughs> So I rounded everybody up and I said, Dad Gummit, that's the last time we're going to say a prayer at any of our balls. <laughs> <laughs> but they kid at Coach Evans, they had WWF wrestling videos and they show them asking you. But Kyle's remained a great friend. Him and Donna were super to us and just super. Kendall Jackson, you know, Kendall played for me for two years and he helped assistant coach for two years. Best thing about Kendall, Kendall and Anthony Porsche were cousins. And Anthony Kendall was my interpreter to Anthony Porsche because Porsche wouldn't talk to me for two years. And Anthony, as you know, was the second leading scorer, so it was vital for me to communicate with Anthony. So uh, Kendall uh, was, was so good at helping me uh, communicate with Anthony. But Kendall, like I said, he's teaching there at Little Rock Central with special ed and does, does a super job. Ryan, Ryan Marshall's not here today. He's the head basketball coach at BB. And uh, him and Patrick were roommates, and that's where most of my gray hair came, was trying to coach both of them together. But uh, Ryan, um, he blew his right knee out his sophomore year. He blew his left knee out his junior year, and then his senior year, he got to play a little bit. And uh, but one thing I liked about Ryan is his, his mom and dad never, ever came up to me wanting to know why Ryan should be playing more. All his dad ever wanted to know was how come we kept raising tuition every semester. That's all he cared about was Ryan's vision. But Ryan, Ryan, really proud about him. They're doing a, a super, super job at, at BB. Again, you know, we had two great sports information directors while I was here, Sonia and, uh, and Josh Peppis. And Josh Peppis, I can't say enough to, he, he comes from a great family. You know, Penny Peppis is here today. Uh, Penny and I came the same year. And uh, we used to tease each other. She'd say, well, I'm the one that's responsible for turning this women's program around. She was the school's all-time leading scorer. And uh, we really have had a good relationship. And Lainey and Josh's mom and, and the Peppers family were just super to us. Uh, Sonia talked a little bit about uh, Coach Garner. I tell you what, you look at that far table back there, you see Coach Garrison. Uh, he's in the sports, Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, and was a legendary coach at Hendricks, Coach Garner, legendary coach at Arkansas College, and Don Dyer, I called him the godfather. He's a legendary at Henderson and UCA, and, and Van Compton was the women's, the women's basketball coach at ULR, and now she's the uh, volleyball coach. But those four people were super to me the first five years that I was in the AIC. You know, again, I'm 26 years old, and I'm, I'm going up against coaching with those guys. But uh, if it would have been for Coach Garner, I would have never had an opportunity <laughs> to coach. Uh, as Sonny said, he's been a lifelong friend of our family. And uh, he always had said, you know, you can come and help me. And you not know, many people have that luxury that, that, man, you can fall back on trying something else. But I'll always be indebted to, to him for giving me that opportunity. And I got to tell you how I met Coach Compton. One day we were sitting in Coach Garner's office, and there were three of us helping him assist that year. And uh, uh, Coach Compton had called and said she was going to Mississippi to recruit a junior college tournament and wanted to know if he'd send one of us young assistants with her. Well, that year I was helping Coach Garner. We'd only won about five games. And, uh, and Coach Garner wasn't in a very good mood because we'd only won about five games. And so I jumped at the chance to go to 
get away and go recruit him. And so I met Coach Compton at uh, Brinkley, and she always she she didn't want to drive, so I always drove her to all every time we recruitment. I got to meet her, and fortunate for me, we've been, become really good friends. And uh, when Coach Newell later that year had an opening at UALR, she was the one that was responsible for going and talking to, to Mike Newell and and helping me get on at UALR. And uh, that brings me to Coach Newell. You know, I was fortunate to be with Coach Newell uh, a couple weeks ago. He got inducted to the UALR uh, Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, when, when we were at the Division I level, we had four assistants. And I always tell everybody, you know, we had four assistants there at UALR, and, and Mike treated us all the same. Bad, bad. <laughs> but, uh, but no, Mike, if it wouldn't have been for Mike, he gave me a, an opportunity to experience Division I basketball. The last three years we were with Mike, we went to an NIT and two NCAA tournaments and won more games. It was probably the three most successful years of, of the history of ULR. But uh, Mike uh, was, was a special person. And again, without having that experience of being at UALR, I don't think I could have ever got the job here at the University of Ozarks. But the first five years, you know, I spent in the AIC was, was really special, and, and not because, you know, we had some outstanding teams. We, we won the AIC and won two, in, two AIC tournaments and went to the national tournament. It was great. And, we did score a lot of points, and uh, I think we averaged close to 90 points, and we were fun to watch. And uh, we did, uh, sorry, bro, we did score 130 something. We lost that game, and, and uh, I remember one night we had we went over to Central Oklahoma, and we got beat 130 to 118. And I'll never forget Lonnie Qualls walking in my office and said, "How can you score 118 points and still get beat?" You know, he just. But, uh, but, but Coach Dyer that was at UCA, uh, he came up here his last year uh, in 93, and we were fortunate to beat them. That was the only game we ever beat UCA, and we beat them pretty good that night. And, you know, Coach Dyer said, you know, that that's, he was retired. He says, I sure am glad this is the last time I ever have to come to Clarksville. <laughs> but I do want to thank him for making one more trip and coming back today. So, Coach Dyer, I appreciate that. Uh, Coach Garrison, uh, when we when I came into the league, he had the top program, and we emulated Hendricks College. Hendricks was a small private school, and uh, they they won thirty something ball games, and three of them were against us that year. But uh, Coach Garrison is such a tremendous person, and then when 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 Hendricks went to Division Three, and then we went to Division Three, I really relied on Coach Garrison for helping me go through that transition. And uh, he's just been a super friend. But Coach Garrison is so good about any time there's something in the paper, he'll cut it, cut it out and send you an article. And then he writes you a little note. And since he's retired, he's missed his calling because he could go to work for Hallmark because he writes the best notes that you can get. But I, I really appreciate those four people at that back table coming today. They are just a tremendous influence in my life. I also, you know, Clarksville, I would have never dreamed coming to Clarksville, this community would embrace me and my family like they did. I didn't know but one person, David Laster, because David was from Magazine. But there were so, so many people that were so good to us, and uh, I, I can't name all of them, but, you know, Dr. Jack Patterson sitting back there in the back with his wife, Lisa. Dr. Jack, he... He, as Sonia said, he was one of our better social buddies. And uh, he, I kind of like Jack when with Dr. Knee's talking about WAG. I don't, I, I've been around WAG a lot of times, but I sure don't remember drinking much coffee with him. <laughs> but, uh, but Jack was super to us. Uh, he was one of the cabin buddies. And he took care of any time we had a problem with that, the whole Clarksville Medical Group, Pee Wee and Larry Stroud, uh, just tremendous friend. Don and Dumpy Stinson, Don was our, with us in the Booster Club, and they've been tremendous friends. Uh, Phil Taylor, Philip Taylor, uh, you know, Philip had to leave. Their family was super. Um, you know, Sid Kern, his dad, Glenn and Jane and Leon. I, I had to tell this story on, on Sid. I told him the other day. When I first got the job here in Clarksville, not even, you know, there didn't know anybody. 
and, then, and I was renting a little house out here on 64. And one day Sid drives up, and I didn't know Sid from Adam. He comes in, he says, hey, I just want to talk to you. It's all over town. I just want to come out here and just get the word straight from the horse's mouth. He said, it's all over town that Jack Stevens from Little Rock sent you up here to be our coach. And uh, I got the biggest kick out of that. And uh, I said, no, I don't know Jack. I don't know Whit either. But, uh, but Sid was named, he, he and, and Reggie and the road dog, we had a lot of good time. But hit him and, and his mom and dad were just super to, to me. Uh, Bobby Teeter, I wish Bobby was here today. Every year after we got through playing, Bobby would say, take the team down there to West, Western Sizzle and I'll pick up the tab. And he didn't care if we had a great season or an average season. He just enjoyed doing that. But the Cecils, the Dickersons, Tom Bell, Leah Willis, KLYR that did our ball games, Mark Muncy, Tim Swindle, and uh, last but not least, my referee friends, Danny Ham, Jim Lewis, Larry Moore, and Chuck Stillwell. Danny had the muffler shop here in town, and on Wednesdays, Wednesday nights, we'd all get together and they'd go down there and talk about how bad the coaches were, and I'd go down there and talk about how bad the officials were. And being officials, I'd have to call the other officials and explain how to get back to Danny Ham's office every year, every week. You know, they weren't very good memories and everything. But uh, here at the University of the Ozarks, when I came in, I could have never imagined the nicest people that I had a chance to work with. Uh, Dr. Aaron and, and Dr. Neese were so supportive of me and our basketball program. Uh, I wish Dr. Neese could have seen some of our teams play back in, in 93 and 94. Uh, Joe Hoey, oh my gosh, Joe Hoey. Did we not have some fun times, Joe? Uh, <laughs> Joe, I tell you what, Joe is such an asset to this university. They, they need to put a, a statue up out here for Joe because he takes care of all these kids and he knows every one of them and he's just a tremendous, tremendous person. Uh, Buddy Smith was our faculty rep. Him and Jeannie were almost at every ball game and Buddy had to teach me algebra just to keep me one day ahead of me teaching the kids. You know, he was so good about that. Jack Jones, Jack called me this morning from Kansas City. Jack and I had so much fun. Uh, he was just a super person. I couldn't ask for a better person to coach with. Uh, Lonnie and Levada Qualls back there, you know, how, how Levada puts up with Lonnie all these years, we'll never know. But I'll tell you a couple of stories on Lonnie. You know, I'd, I'd come out of my office ready for the, for the game and thought I'd be looking good and walk up to Lonnie and he'd say, does your wife know you've got her shoes on? <laughs> he, he'd make fun of my shoes. <clears throat> Again, you know, he can come in there and tell us he got big, but uh, uh, but Lonnie and Jerry and Jack were just three three people that were just super to me. Robert Wofford, you know, he had so many of our players in his classes, and Robert was on the selection committee that, that hired me, and uh, I remember calling calling Robert, and he remained, uh, you know, he was another one of our our cabin buddies. Uh, Sally Wood and Bruce Elmore. Um, taught with, with us in the education department down there. They were just great instructors and, and they really cared about our players and took a big interest in our program. And I'm just so glad that they're still here. Uh, Jeff Hart and John Jansen. I can't believe those two guys made it back to town. Jeff's <laughs> over here. He's, uh, he started our baseball program and did a tremendous job, made it competitive immediately. John started softball. John and, and Robin went to high school together there at Cabot. She couldn't believe we hired John up here. But, uh, but like I said, I'm surprised these guys made it back in town. I think there's still a couple of warrants out. Joe, you may have to help them get out of here today. But they're really, really good friends. But I appreciate them coming back. Uh, obviously, you know, in coaching, uh, we have a coach's wife is special. And Robin, she's put up with me coaching for 11 years. You know, there's a lot of times she stayed at home and, and uh, I was out recruiting or, or out at games, especially when we went to Division Three. but I always said that uh, she saw me, saw, saw the, the Clint Easton, when Clint Eastwood in me. She saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, uh, but, 
we got married after our first year up here. We got married here at Clarksville, and uh, she took the job of dressing me. And so she she really didn't pay that much attention at the ball games at first, unless somebody heckled me about what I looked like. We were playing at Tech one night, and somebody said something about the sweater I had on, and I thought they were going to have to kick her out of the ball game. It was just bad. And when when we got married, you know, she didn't really know much about basketball. And we'd come home from the ball games and she'd ask questions like, uh, what's traveling mean? Or what's, what's goaltending? And uh, how come you don't play everybody? How come everybody didn't to play tonight? Or, uh, how come you get so many technicals? <laughs> but, uh, then, then about after we, she'd been in it for four or five years, she'd come home and it was questions like, what were you thinking taking Stephen Kennedy out of there? <laughs> Why don't you get Anthony Porsche more shots? Why didn't you call timeout on that last play? What were you thinking playing Ryan Marshall? How come you get so many technicals? But uh, it takes a special person to be a coach's wife. And I've been truly blessed with Robin. And I can say she's always been my number one recruit. As coaches, you know, you're always asked about <clears throat> your mentors. And I had two of the best, my mom and dad. Uh, you know, for me and my brother and sister, they've provided such an example for all of us. And, uh, you know, they travel this state watching us play all these games. And uh, they let me chase my dreams. And uh, they've been an inspiration for me, and I'm so proud of both of them. But in closing, I'd like to thank everyone at this university. Uh, Dr. Neese, you know, one of the biggest accomplishments, we've had a lot of accomplishments, but I still, one of the biggest accomplishments for me was being able to be on the selection committee for you. What you and Cherie have done in your period is unbelievable, and I'm so glad that y'all have stayed here. I want to thank so many of my friends from Little Rock and from around the state that came in, and I want to close by saying, uh, you know, George Strait, has a song right now. It says, it's not the breath you take, but the moments that take your breath away. And today, y'all taking my breath away. And thank you so much. <clears throat>
173 victories, the most in basketball program history. They won 21 games a school record three times. John was named the Arkansas Intercollegiate Coach of the Year in 2000, or excuse me, 1992 and 93, after leading the Eagles to a 23 and 9 overall record and a first place finish in the conference. He was also named the NAIA District 17 Coach of the Year following the 1992-93 season and the 93-94 season. In 2000, Johnny was named the American Southwest Conference Coach of the Year after Ozarks went 16-9 and finished second place in the American Southwest Conference. Coach Johnson is currently the athletic director for the Rock Arkansas Public School District. He and his wife, Bob, and the parents of Drake and Bryce, who are all three here today, he's a 1984 graduate of the University of Arkansas. Let's hear it for Coach Johnny Johnson.